Hello future, this Sega looking thing right here is an NES. Well, more accurately, it's a CCE Turbo Game VG9000T, a Brazilian NES clone from the early 90s that if made today would give Nintendo's lawyers a stroke. And in this part of the Eric experiment, we're gonna see if it works, see why it has two cartridge slots, and hopefully play some games on it. So let's go, let's do it, let's just do it. If you are into retro gaming, you have probably heard about Tectoy, a Brazilian company that has the license to manufacture and distribute Sega consoles and games to this day and has created many variations of Sega's Master System and Mega Drive slash Genesis throughout the last three decades. Tectoy started operations in the late 80s, a period when Brazil was under a series of market reserve policies that lasted until around 1992. Those policies heavily restricted imports of computer equipment and software, with the goal of encouraging local local manufacturing and technological development to make sure the country didn't get left behind in the exploding technology sector. What you might not know though is that because everyone and their cousin wanted to get their hands on computers and consoles from overseas, the whole thing ended up kind of backfiring because companies decided to just produce clones of machines that were popular in other countries and call it a day. That led to a huge amount of clones of stuff like the NES and the Atari 2600, but also computers like the Apple II, ZX Spectrum and the TRS-80. One of the companies that wanted a piece of that pie was the already established CCE, or Comércio de Componentes Eletrônicos, which translates to something like Electronic Components Commerce. Anyway, CCE entered the video game market with the CCE Super Game VG2800, a clone of the Atari 2600 with a design inspired by the Sega SG-1000. Later on, in 1989, they went to release the Top Game VG8000, another Sega SG-1000 looking machine, but this time, an NES clone that was compatible with 60-pin Famicom cartridges and Brazilian-produced cartridges with the same form factor. And like the Famicom, it had hardwired controllers, but with the design inspired by the SG-1000 ones. The VG-8000 was followed up by the Top Game VG-9000 in 1990, and then the VG-9000T, which is the one I have here, in 1991. They both maintained the same design, but had this really cool feature where you could slide the lid up and down to reveal either a slot for 60-pin Famicom-style cartridges or a slot for 72-pin NES-style cartridges. They also had composite video added to them and they no longer had hardwired controllers, instead using DB9 connectors like the Mega Drive and the Master System. The only difference between the VG9000 and the VG9000T that I'm aware of is that the former had its controllers designed after the NES controllers and the T variant had controllers designed to resemble an upside-down Genesis controller, which sadly I don't have. But I do have this adapter here that hopefully will allow me to use this NES controller on it. Now that we know a bit of the history and why this thing has two cartridge slots, let's have a quick look inside of it. Here's the main board. There's nothing under it, just solder points. Well, it seems someone has been in here before as there is some electrical tape holding the reset button as it looks like it may have fallen off at some point. Here are our two cartridge slots which, like I mentioned before, allow connecting both Famicom and NES style cartridges. The PSU is comprised of this huge ass transformer plus a couple of components on the main board. Here's the CPU, a UMC UA6547 which is um, a clone of the NES CPU I guess? This other IC, the UMC UA6548, is the PPU, or as the kids call it, the Picture Processing Unit, made specifically for Brazilian PAL-AM systems, which is responsible for generating the composite video signal. I could not find any information about these two ICs, also by UMC, so my guess is that they are the system memory. I say that because the other ones aren't, but don't quote me on that. To put this thing in perspective, let's have a look inside of an actual NES so we can compare them. This is indeed my pal NES from the first part of the Eric experiment. Here's our CPU, the RP2A07. This is our 2C07 PPU. And here are the SRAM chips. Let's have a quick look at them side by side. 
As you can see here, the real NES has a smaller board, but it has more ICs, 12 in total as opposed to the 9 ICs in the VG9000T. As interesting as looking inside of these things may be, sadly I don't have much more insight to give. So now that we looked inside of the CCE console and nothing seems physically wrong with it, we can safely test it. And that's a big fat lie! All the footage you just looked at was shot after I tested the console with games because it was only then that it occurred to me to look inside of it. But anyway, to actually test this thing, I want to connect the console to 120-ish volts at 60 Hz, which, similarly to the US, are the parameters for most of the Brazilian electrical grid. Sure, I could connect it to the 240 volt at 50 Hz Australian grid directly, as the console can be switched to work with 220 volts, and it can probably work with 240 just fine. But I don't know how well it's gonna handle 50 Hz, and I don't trust its power circuit due to its age. So I decided to steal an idea from a tech moan video from a few years ago and bought myself this 425 watt power inverter that is able to convert 12 volts DC to 120 ish volts AC at 60 Hertz on this side I have two power outlets which I can use to connect the console and on the other side I have these two connectors for the 12 volt power source which will come from this power supply that can provide 12 volts at around the wattage the inverter needs this should be more than enough power for this console and all of the stuff I'll pay for overweight luggage in Japan soon. We just need an adapter to connect the Brazilian power plug to the American socket. Now that we have power, we just need to connect AV cables to the console. We also need to accept the fact that the RF cable is hardwired to the console, meaning that even if we're not using it, it will always be dangling from the back. I wonder if some people just cut this thing right off. Anyway, after connecting the controller, let's have a quick look at the games I want to test on this thing. First, the Super Mario Bros cartridge made by CCE themselves. It has the same form factor as a Famicom cartridge with 60 pins, which makes sense because, as I mentioned earlier, their first NES console only had a 60 pin cartridge slot. Then we'll try an actual Famicom game, Saint Seiya, which is based on an anime that I am probably 99% of Latin American people around my age are familiar with. After that, we'll try this NTSC Top Gun from Marka. And finally, this pal Super Mario Bros. 3 from Breton Yevna. That was horrible. Right, so let's get this party started. Good old Super Mary. I don't know if this is actually supposed to show Super Mary or if it's a glitch because this cartridge seems a bit borked. I had to try turning the console off and on again a couple of times to get it going, but it seems to be working fine. So, I, I don't know. Okay, enough of Super Mary. Next, I tried my Japanese Saint Seiya. Which seemed to be dead. Every time I turned the console on, I would get this blue screen. Well, let's test the Top Gun. Uh, a gray screen. What are the chances two games are dead? Well, I have this other NTSC game here, Othello, which I tried as well but got the same result. The same happened with the PAL Super Mario 3. At this point, I was thinking that either the console is defective or maybe it's not as compatible as I thought it would be because Super Mario did work. Good old Super Mario. Not willing to give up just yet, I found a scan of the console's manual to see if there's any information about compatibility and as I scrolled down, I saw this picture. It worked! So the cartridge is supposed to go in backwards. Upon closer inspection, the slot does have notches that indicate the cartridge should go in backwards, but they don't actually block the cartridge from going in. This is cool though, the NTSC Othello is working. I have no idea what's going on here. Let's try Top Gun again. It also works! Okay, and the PAL Super Mario Bros. 3? And yeah, it's working! Oh, 
Oh yeah, this is the monitor I built for the Tiny486 computer. I've been using it for testing all sorts of things as it's tiny and it supports HDMI, composite and VGA which makes it super practical. Oh crap. Oh crap. Oh crap, Jesus, not even the first level? Okay, just ignore that. Since these work, I assume the Saint Seiya cartridge is busted, so I bought this other Famicom game, Baseball. And it works! This is so cool, this thing can play NES games from any region. And maybe I can play with Mega Drive controller since this thing has DB9 controller ports. Hmm, apparently not. What about a Master System controller? Nope, but the Master System controller doesn't have the start and select buttons. So maybe if I connect the NES controller first so I can start the game, and then swap the controller after the game starts, it will work? Well, if all buttons pausing, then unpausing and jumping count as working, then it does, I guess. Take that, Goomba! Even with a non-functioning controller, I'm amazing at platformers. Anywho, let's try this swap strategy with the Mega Drive controller. Uh, this one just pauses the game forever. And there you have it! Looking at this Brazilian clone of the NES was a lot of fun, and the fact that it can play games from any region is really awesome. I mean, sure, it's not super impressive as it can easily make an NES region free, and there are third-party consoles that can play any NES game perfectly these days with HDMI output and other niceties. But I think it's still fascinating that such a console was available in the early 90s, even if only in Brazil. It's also interesting to learn a bit more about the history of gaming in my own country, as I was too or three years old when this thing came out, and my first contact with an NES was the real Nintendo one. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure to click the like button. And I'll definitely be exploring other Brazilian consoles and clones at some point, like that CCEVG2800, which needs some work and I think will be a great video. So if you want to see that, and other content related to retro gaming, retro computing, and other tangentially related subjects, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future uploads. Also, if you are one of the people who asked for the design and STL files for my Tiny486 computer, I made them available on Patreon, including the Gerber files for the PCBs. The case and monitor are available for 3 bucks each on my Patreon store, but you can have access to them and any other future designs I come up with for no extra cost if you're a patron. Make sure to check it out if you're interested, and don't forget to join the Discord server if you'd like to chat with other people who are also interested in the projects related to the Eric experiment. I also post updates there and show up to chat every now and then. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching.